today's scripture comes from 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 6. Paul's ministry to Thessalonica. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of God, we dared to tell his gospel in the face of strong oppression. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak to those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please we're not trying to please people, but God, who tests our hearts. You know we never use flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up our greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ we could have attested our authority. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, church. Welcome those joining us online, those that will be joining us later. We welcome you. Hope you're having a great day as we worship together. Uh, it's always great to be in the house of God. Amen? All right. Let us pray together. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. The Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we are still in the lame duck series and we are uh, going through. And this is, of course, if you're joining with us for the first time, I want to let you know that this is a, a series about all the lame duck excuses we give for sin and having sin in our life and the things that we do that we know we shouldn't do, but we do them, and then we somehow justify them with some rationale, but when you look at them and expose them and really think about them, they're lame duck excuses, aren't they? So we looked at week one, we looked at it just happens, and we looked at how that's just really a lack of responsibility. Sin doesn't just happen. We need, you know what, if it's only this one time, you have to ask in that moment, who's on the throne of your heart? Because just this one time means that at some point, God is on the throne of your heart. And we looked at last week, everyone is doing it, which is one of my favorites. And we looked at how really that's a denial of who we're called to be, right? That we are actually called to be set apart from the earth and not to just go with the flow, to take a different path, to be a different people. And we looked at that week uh, last week. Well, this week we're looking at yet another one. And as you look in your bulletin, you will see it says, no one will notice. Oh, come on, church. Yeah, you're looking at me like, I've never used that excuse. No, nah, come on. Oh, look, come on. No one will notice. Now, if you really think about this in our private, individualized lives that we like to have in, in our, our country, we, we really kind of can take this one to heart, right? I mean, have you ever heard the statement, it's none of your business what happens when I'm at home, right? Or it's none of your business what I do. Now, in some method, that's true, right? Like, we don't want everybody spying over our shoulder in the sense of the way we do. But how many times is that a cover-up? I'm doing something bad, and I don't want you to hold me accountable, right? And it's this offset of this idea of no one, or no one will notice, right? If I just have the space and can do it, no one will notice. When I was uh, uh, in seminary, and even before, I used to work at uh, burrito places, you know, like Chipotle kind of thing, but it's Qdoba. There's actually a few in Columbus, but you know, you like roll the burrito and they make it. Anyways, so I was a shift manager there when I was in seminary, and I had this experience once where. Um, there was this, this kind of a habit of people that would come in and order a water, right? And then there's the fountain dispenser, right, that you go get your own drink, right? And you just watch them, and they walk over. And don't even attempt to get the water, right? Don't even look at the water. They literally just put on the Coke, right? And it's funny because it makes a different noise and everything, so it's, like, pretty obvious when you order a water and get the, get the soda. Well, I had this one day where I was shift managing, and, and a family came through, and a mother with a couple of her sons. And there was a the younger son was probably about 11, 12, something like that. And uh, he got a water and uh, walked over, and uh, yeah, I saw him do the, the turn back. You know, I was working the cash register, so I was waiting for some burritos to come down the line. And I just kind of watched him because I kind of had that feeling, you know. And did the turn back, saw me, and he goes, hmm, get some ice. Turn back, <laughs> saw me, get some water. And then I had to do a burrito thing, but I'm like, oh, I got to watch this kid. So I look back up. He turns around one last time as he's got his full drink, and he goes, Psh. right? And I'm like, oh, this is just getting, you know, this is just funny. So I see him fill up the ice cup again. A couple, of, he does it again, right? So he, he starts putting it on the wrong thing again, and he sees me looking at him. So he, he, he dumps that out, gets the ice again, gets the, pretends to get the water, starts walking off. 
And uh, as I see him pause because I get stuck with a bunch of like orders that come through, you know, got type stuff in and all that stuff. And so I'm like, you know, this kid knows that he, I saw him. Like, I mean, no, un undoubtedly, and he knew he was doing something he shouldn't, and he purposely dumped it out when I, when someone was watching him. So I was like, you know, this is one of those moments where in a young man's life you need a character check, you know. And so I had the strange suspicion that he had gone back and dumped his water out and gotten the soda again. So. Of course, I walked over, you know, I got one over, got, a, got some water, and I could see as I walked over to the cup, I could see him sitting, and he could see in his drink it was not clear, and I was filled with something else. So I went and got a water, and I stopped by his table, and I said, hey, man, just so you know, like, uh, I know you ordered a water, and I and, uh, saw you were having some trouble there, so here's your water, you know, if you don't need help next time, let me get it for you, type of thing. I tried to be as, like, as polite about it without being just totally in your face, like, like you know, because his mom didn't see any of this happen. And of course, uh, you ever in those moments where the, the parent doesn't see what happened and just jumps down your throat? Well, I got the foot stomp, I got the front and then and then and then I got the, the you know, managers called in on me to like come check what happened. And I said, hey, what happened? And they go, whatever. Told the lady, right? And I remember she came back very sheepishly the next time when she came back through the order line because <laughs> she got to me. She was just like, oh, I remember this guy. Oh, my son did that thing. Oh. But nonetheless, it all worked out just fine, and they ended up buying a drink. It all worked out just, just fine. But there was that moment, right, where in a young man's life in that moment, this young man knew that most likely no one was paying attention, but just in case. Ooh, someone's watching. Behave. No one will notice. Right? And I was amazed uh, when I was a youth minister, uh, the same thing, right? I had to just kind of instill upon it. And part of it is kind of a blend of everyone's doing it because it was a common occurrence, and, and but... Nonetheless, I had to explain to my youth that, you know, when you go into a restaurant and do that, it's the same thing as going into a gas station and grabbing a Coke bottle and walking out with it, right? It's, it's stealing. It's just flat out stealing. And it was really hard to get that mind in there. But so much of it revolved around that idea when no one will notice, what's the big deal? Of course, there's a big problem with that theory, right? And, and I'm going to answer this question or think about this two ways. And, and kind of one level is obvious, right? Because you're, if you believe in God, there's obviously someone watching, right? And we'll get to that in just a minute. But even a different way of looking at it is there's another problem is that there is someone who will always know. Even if no one else is looking. Even if God took a nap, right? There's someone that will know. And it's you. You will know. When I was growing up, uh, about my fifth grade or so, I remember, uh, you know, one of these deals where everybody's talking and the teacher's there and the kids are all just talking about things. The teacher's kind of holding us accountable for a test and telling us not to cheat and all these different things. And my, uh, I wasn't even a friend, just kind of someone that was in the class, uh, happened to say, he said, hey, you know what? My dad told me that he, uh, I don't remember if he's a lawyer or what he was. He was some type of something that had to go through one of the big tests, like the bar or the LSAT. I don't remember what it was. It was something big. And he, he mentioned that he cheated. And barely got by. And all of us are like, well, pff, that's actually a pretty good point. Maybe I could cheat too and go make a lot of money one day. Woo, yeah, like, like, good, take that, teacher. And I'll never forget the teacher, you know, those teachable moments. And God bless teachers. You have some of the hardest jobs. I remember the teacher just looked squarely at this youth, this little kid's face and said, you know what? I bet he's always been ashamed of it. And the kid just stopped in his tracks and all of us did too. We're like, ooh, bird, right? <laughs> but it was true. And I really, that kind of stuck with me. That was one of those teachable moments where all of a sudden it really did make sense. Like, you're always going to know. Always. Even when you try to make up all the lies and try to change the facts and all that stuff, you know how we do that with our memories sometimes. You're always going to deep down inside of yourself, you're always going to know. And if you're really honest, if we're really honest with ourselves, we're always going to be ashamed of it. You see, our character is worth so much more than whatever we trade it for. I laugh because in the temptation of Jesus, I laugh because, you know, so many times we think, oh, it's just a small thing, no big deal, right? Oh, it's just a Coke. But think about how opposite the way Jesus works. When Satan came to tempt Jesus, he didn't say, oh, why don't you order a water and get a Coke, right? <laughs> right? Why don't you just take that bag of peanuts? He said, I'll give you the whole earth. Right? right? It took the whole entire earth, basically. All the kingdom, all the, the, the no, Jesus, you can get all of this without suffering. I'll just give it all to you if you just do this one thing. If you just test God in this one way. If you just follow me in this one idea. It took everything 
for Jesus to be tempted. Right? If you think about it, that's how we should be too. It should never be the case that we're tempted by something small. It should never occur to us that, oh, this is just no big deal or this is just something no one will ever see. If we're going to be tempted, let's be tempted by something big, right? If you get that million-dollar check, hello. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's, not, let's talk big stuff here, people. Be tempted by what's big, not what is small in our life. Because the truth is this, is that you will know it, even if no one else ever does. You will always be ashamed of it no matter if no one else ever does. But of course, that's not the only person that knows. There's a hand that walks with us every step of the way, an eye that is upon us. The eye that looks upon birds and knows where they go and takes care of them is the same eye that knows the amount of hairs on our head. It's God, our Heavenly Father, is never oblivious to what's going on in our life. There's never such a time that we are alone. There's never such a time where we are forsaken. There's never such a time where God has just said, ah, I'm too busy watching my movie, right? God always knows the motives of our heart, the actions that we do. He knows when we're tested, and he knows if we think to ourselves, no one else will see. Our scripture this morning comes from Thessalonians. It's, of course, Paul and, and some other apostles that have been visiting the church in Thessalonica. And uh, it's a kind of a place over by uh, Philippi, which is kind of like Greece, kind of like that panhandle part of Greece, not the down southern part, but kind of the upper part there. And as you look at uh, this, this, this part of Scripture that Paul is saying, that the Thessalonians, he's basically kind of admonishing them. and He's kind of bragging a little bit. He's trying to say, hey, people, listen to me. Hey, church, listen to what I'm saying. Remember how I came and lived with you and how the other people with us that were with us when we came to you, right? Now, back in the day, it's important to know this, that when you brought teaching somewhere, if you were a teacher and stuff like that, it was totally acceptable to be paid for it, right? So you were totally accepted that it would be a, a totally okay case if the apostles came and said, all right, we've taught you this teaching, now provide housing for us, provide food for us, provide all these different things. But Paul and the other apostles that went with them decided not to do that. When they went to the church of Thessalonica, they went and they worked with their hands. And they preached, they worked for their living, if you will. And did everything they could not to be a burden to the church. And he's trying to remind them, hey guys, remember when I came to you. And remember that when I did come to you, I had, we had suffered before we came to you. And when we came to you, we were oppressed. We suffered to get to you. We, we suffered to preach to you. We suffered to live for you. And we even toiled with our hands while we were with you. Listen to me. I'm trying to lead you right, right? He's trying to remind them, listen to what we're telling you. And don't be deceived by other voices that come along your way. And he reminds them of these words. I just want to read them to you again from chapter 2 of the Thessalonian book. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. I love that word because if you look at the Greek, it came to mean just kind of trickery in general, of like, you know, kind of shysting someone. But it really has the idea of a fish lure, of hooking someone, right? The idea that there's people out there that are trying to just give you that bait once they got you, they reel you right in, right? They use you for their purposes. He's saying, we didn't do that to you. On the contrary, we, men, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. We know we never used flattery, nor did we put a mask to cover up our greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from men, not from you, anyone else. There's a sheer fact in our life that the thing that it gets wrong, this idea of no one will see me, is this fundamental fact that all of us play for an audience of one. Right? There's one person we need to please ultimately. One. And that person knows everything we do. That person knows even the things we don't do, but the things that we were tested on and the things that we said no to, the things that we gave into, there was all of that. And when this person looks at yours and I life, who do they see? Do they see someone like Paul and the apostles trying to please to live God, doing even hard work and not even taking their due when it's uh, properly before them, but serving? Or do they see something else? I, uh, I like movies. I like movies too. But do you guys remember the movie Amadeus? Anybody? No? Really? Come on, Amadeus. Amadeus, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the movie Amadeus, it's about uh, Wolfgang Mozart, and 
uh, it was an amazing movie. Really, it's kind of a fun one. It's, it's an old one now, well, old 1980s, but uh, it's, a, it's a good one. And uh, there's this point where it's all about, it's actually kind of a fun movie. It's all about jealousy and envy. It's really about like Soleri, who's one of these uh, other co composers, and, and Mozart, and how he's just jealous and envious and wants to just ruin Mozart and the whole entire movie. But it's about like this whole movie. And at one point, Mozart is doing some a grand performance. He's got his symphony going. He's got, a, you know, the opera singers are going. He's doing this great performance. And the emperor is there, right, hanging out in the audience. He's performing for the emperor. And, and all the people that know music are just floored, are just talking about this is a, a grace from God coming down from heaven and being musically before us. Except the emperor is not really into music too much. <laughs> if you've seen the movie, it's kind of funny. The emperor just flat out yawns in the middle of it. <laughs> and this grand work of art, right, gets totally trashed and put aside, and everybody becomes the mockery of the people. Because in that moment, Mozart was playing for an audience of one. Now, we don't serve an emperor who is not interested in what we do, but we serve an emperor. We serve a God who loves us, who cares for us, who wants to know that we are people of character, that wants to know that we are tempted by things, but we say no to them, that wants to know that when no one else is looking, we know that our eye is still on him, because we know his eye is still on us. But even in those quiet moments, even in those dark moments, we play for an audience of one. Let us pray. Lord, as we're here today, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for the leadership that Paul and the other apostles gave and how they encourage us even to this day that, God, we do try to please you. That even though, Lord, you've called us to love one another and all these different things, ultimately, we need to please you. Lord, help us to always fix our eye on that goal. And even in those times where we are tempted, especially those times where no one else is looking, help us to remember your face right before us, that you see all those things. God, also remind us that we will always know ourselves even what comes about what we do or that we will be ashamed of those times we give in. But God, we do remember that you are a God of forgiveness. And so we claim that here again today. Help none of us leave this place without receiving your forgiveness and without being encouraged to walk along your paths. Amen.